It was like hanging out with one of the Beatles or something. It was unbelievable. I remember the huge legions of fans, and these girls were like, Michael, oh my God! He had a lot of big things happening to him. It was all huge at the time. Michael J. Fox! But the star paid a heavy price. He felt like there was really no one to call because, you know, they're going to say, well, so what? You're Michael J. Fox. That's a strange kind of isolation. We would sit on, along the curb and talking about the insecurities. In my mind, someone was coming to the door saying, you know, give it back. And I thought, well, I'm going to be drunk when they get here. Then he got blindsided. That was when the neurologist said that, that it was, it was Parkinson's. 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 We had no idea that he was in pain, that he was suffering. We never knew that. I found myself at seven years not battling it, not struggling with it, not suffering from it, not breaking under the burden of it, but dealing with it. Michael J. Fox never lost his sense of humor. Because I'm the mayor. Oh, don't you, because I'm the mayor, me. <laughs> now to know that he was able to be such a gifted comedic actor under such difficult and very unfunny circumstances was just phenomenal. <laughs> In the next two hours, exclusive interviews and rare photos reveal the giant spirit of a little guy. He's fighting for his life, he's fighting for everybody else's life at the same time. This is the amazing story of Michael J. Fox. Time for quietly soldiering on is through. The E! True Hollywood story. The war against Parkinson's is a winnable war, and I have resolved to play a role in that victory. The journey began on June 9, 1961, when Michael Andrew Fox was born in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. He was the fourth child of William and Phyllis Fox. My dad was in the military. My mom was a payroll clerk. His dad being in the forces, they move every few years. I lived all over the country. It was kind of a nomadic existence. We were never in a neighborhood five minutes, but everybody knew Michael. He enjoyed people. He could sit and talk to an elderly person or, or someone of his own age and have fun with it. The family learned how to make do with very little. We, we played games, we played cards, we did all of these things at home because we just couldn't afford to go out. I loved um, music and I loved uh, art. When, when he was younger, he, he pursued everything with a real vigor. He played basketball, he played baseball, but hockey has always been his main love. As a child, Michael dreamed of playing professional hockey. He was short, but tough. One of his worst injuries that he received as a hockey player, um, he got hit right between the eyes with the hockey puck and, and ended up in the hospital for a, a day or two with concussion. The thing that got Michael was his speed. Fox's physical skills were matched by his quick wit. My humor was always more defensive. It was always more, if I can make you laugh, you probably wouldn't kick the crap out of it. The big guy's coming to beat you up, and so, you know, make a joke and, and, and live to run another day. In 1971, Michael's father retired from the Canadian Army and the family settled in Burnaby, British Columbia, a suburb of Vancouver. I was strangely popular in junior high school. I mean, everybody knew who I was. I played hockey and, you know, chased girls around, and I was about five foot nothing. So, you know, I was, I was a presence. He had a group of friends. They had a little band. Played a lot of BTO and that kind of stuff, a lot of Stones and Led Zeppelin. The confidence Michael got from performing led him to high school drama class. Music gradually kind of just gave way to acting. He played the Dormouse in uh, Alice in Wonderland. I, I couldn't get over it. He was really good. He impressed both his dad and I tremendously. He was alive. He was the energy in the thing. That's where every eye went. But theater and rock and roll didn't help Fox fit into his working class neighborhood. There were a lot of people um, who thought it was silly to, to want to be an artist or want to be an actor or want to be a musician. And that kind of frightened me because I didn't know what else I could do. 
Michael's drama teacher got him an audition to play a 10-year-old in a Canadian TV show called Leo and Me. Well, I just gave him a call and said that I had someone a bit older, but he could, he could do it fine. You know, he could play younger. And I figured I'd be the brightest 10-year-old they ever met. As soon as they saw him, then they just said yes right away. Leo, if we get evicted again, it'll be four times this year. It was a regular gig, and it was with real professional actors and real professional everybody. Leo and me are partners. And it pays reasonably well for a 14-year-old kid who hasn't worked before. Real money. By the time he entered 12th grade, Michael juggled school and acting. One of the things that he did was a show called Letters from Frank. And it was with Maureen Stapleton and Art Carney and Mike Farrell. It was this kid from Canada who came in to play my son. There was just simply this desire to become a successful professional. Michael had it in spades. I really um, started to meet actors who, who I really, uh, you know, I just got, I just got it. I just got what they did, and I, and I realized that it was the kind of nonconformist, ne'er-do-well, goof-off, but semi-serious society that I belonged in. So I knew that was it for me. That's what I wanted to do. Michael's passion didn't help his grades. Mike's attendance at school was uh, uh, spotty at best. He'll say he couldn't come to drama class ever because he was working all day. He was more concerned about getting to, getting to work and, and doing the work and preparing for the work. He would, uh, uh, again, push the envelope a little bit, and I think he paid the academic price for that. It didn't matter. Fox was leaving his mark on the stage, and the industry took notice. People that were involved were impressed with Michael, and he was then 17 years old, and they said, you know, when you turn 18, you should go down to Los Angeles. They really thought that's where the work was, and if he really wanted to be successful, that was the move he'd need to make. In April of 1979, Michael went to L.A. to find representation. His dad drove him, and he got an agent without too much problem. Fox signed with the well-respected Gersh Agency and immediately booked a Disney movie called Midnight Madness. Michael returned home to Canada and waited until shooting began in L.A. When Mike told me that he, he intended to go to Los Angeles to pursue his acting career, I thought, just like everybody else, you know, it's, it's a dream and it's, uh, you know, you gotta go, you gotta do what you gotta do. That spring, Michael dropped out of high school. I should have been uh, more nervous and kind of scared than I was. People, you know, always kind of talk to me in terms of, well, what a brave decision or whatever, but it was just what I wanted to do. I was surprised that he was willing to go at 18 because he was always very close to us all. I recall the night before he was leaving, uh, John Wayne had died. And uh, I think the last thing I said to him is we, we said, see you later. I said, Mike, they're making room in, in uh, Hollywood for you. On June 10th, the day after his 18th birthday, Michael and his father once again made the long trip to Los Angeles, this time for good. Bill took him down and got him set up, and he came home, and he assured me that everything was fine. I had this one-room apartment that I had rented for $250 a month, which at the time was actually a huge amount of money. And uh, it was really small. It was like 16 feet by like 8 feet with a bathroom that I washed my dishes in the sink. There was no kitchen. And I had a mattress and an alarm clock. Michael's role in Midnight Madness made him eligible for the Screen Actors Guild. But there was one problem. He wanted a catchier name. I was watching Bonnie and Clyde um, the night before I went down to the union to fill out my paperwork. And, you know, Michael J. Pollard always made me laugh. And I always thought he was a good actor. And um, so that, you know, I thought it sounded cool. Michael J. Pollard, Michael J. Fox. With a new name, a SAG card, and a role in a major motion picture, Michael finally felt like he belonged. Then, the film ended, and the Screen Actors Guild went on strike. If you're a professional and you're a member of the union, you are obeying the union's uh, dictate, or that is that you don't work. Fox spent the next year surviving on macaroni and cheese, beer, and cigarettes. It was a really tough time. Basically, he had a couch in an apartment, and that was about it. And he was running out of cash. He ended up selling all his furniture just to pay the bills as he went, till finally he had none. He used the pay phone, he gave it as his home phone, and he had to stay at the phone booth waiting for the calls and pretending they were phoning him at his apartment. 
When the strike finally ended, Michael quickly landed a few commercials. I got a hot seat out of the shower. You think I like scrubbing? You don't have to scrub. Not with Tylex Instant Mildew Stain Remover. Mom, I can't clean this without scrubbing. Tylex can. It's powerful. Just spray it, then leave. Mildew stains begin to disappear on contact with no scrubbing. The mildew stains are gone. By 1982, the jobs stopped coming. Michael found himself broke again. That's very hard on a person, especially a person who's had a fair amount of success, and then it all seems to go to zero. He had some tough times in Los Angeles, and, and it was difficult for him. He was just down at the bottom, thinking, if I don't get something soon, i got to go home or get a job, you know, a day job. But he was at about zero. I was really starving. I mean, I had no money. I had no phone. I had no... It was really bad. In the spring of 1982, Michael J. Fox struggled to make ends meet while searching for an acting gig. One audition he landed was for the role of Alex Keaton in a new sitcom called Family Ties. Casting director Judith Wiener scrambled for a replacement after first pick Matthew Broderick dropped out. He was following a very tough act. He came to do a pre-read for me before he, he went for producers. I, I did something that's probably as inappropriate as Michael didn't even finish the scene. I said, you're Alex. Wiener set up a meeting between Michael and executive producer Gary David Goldberg. That particular day, he made a choice before he came in to play kind of the darker side of Alex Keaton. Went in, met Gary, it was a big deal, I was all excited. I, I thought, this is it, I got this, and went in, he hated me. And I just said, thank you very much, you're a lovely young man, thanks for playing. And uh, Judith Wiener said, okay, you have made the biggest mistake of your life. The search was on, again. We saw thousands of other people and we weren't finding the right person. But Judith Wiener tried to convince Gary to see Michael again, and she kept bugging him and bugging him. And I said, you know, I don't want to see him again because I know it's not him. And he'd say, no, look, I'm an adult human being. I know what I don't like, and I don't like that kid, and I don't want to see him again. Every single day called and said to Gary, we have to get Michael back in. I think he made a bad choice. Finally, one day, I think he was in a really good mood. He was like, okay, fine, Judith, for you. I'll see him, but I'm not going to hire him. Fox returned for round two. I killed him. Went into like totally blew him away. And he was perfect, you know, he was Alex. And so he left and I turned to Judith and I said, why didn't you tell me about this guy? He's great. Get a pen, you know. Goldberg got Michael's agent on the horn. Well, so we called Bob Gersh and we go, hey, we want to make the deal. He goes, I have to wait for him to call me because Mike didn't have a phone. And he, uh, he used to get his phone calls at this Pioneer Chicken place up in Highland. Michael finally got the call, and in 1982, he joined Michael Gross, Meredith Baxter Burney, Justine Bateman, and Tina Yothers to shoot the Family Ties pilot. Well, I'm sorry, Kimberly. I don't think he's... Alex P. Keaton here. <laughs> Smooth, Alex. When Michael added the P in Alex P. Keaton, I remember Gary Goldberg, our executive producer, and... Uh, just this is uproarious laugh. I don't think we ever found out what it stood for, but it seemed like a perfect affectation for, for Alex and his uh, quest for taking over the world. There was a sense that night that I, I was doing pretty well, and people were laughing at what I was doing. NBC chief Brandon Tartikoff wasn't one of them. Brandon goes, um, Gary, we love the show. We, uh, we want to pick it up. We have one note. And I go, great. What's the one note? He said, replace Michael Fox. And I said, this guy is very proficient and he hits the comedy but um i don't think we're talking about somebody who's going to be on a lunchbox and i said i don't know a thermos maybe i mean i don't know how do you cast that way gary said well if you replace him you can do the show without me because you know he's he's the kid tartikoff caved and michael finally had a steady job but it took a while to reflect in his bank account at the time when we first started the show, he had, I think, a little apartment in Brentwood. And I don't know why, but he didn't have a car. And we very often hitchhike um, into the studio, and sometimes Meredith would give him rides. He'd say, you know, I'll pick you up at a certain time. So he said, fine, pull in the alley behind the apartment and beep. So I'd do that, and then I'd hear rumble, 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 and the shower go on. I'd go, ah, ah, ah. And so I'd sit there and wait in the alley until 
he'd come running out and just throw himself wet in the car, and we'd race off to Paramount. I guess he was sort of dry en route. When Fox did spend money, he didn't lay out much. I drove in one day, and here's Michael arriving in his Honda. And I, I go, oh, Mike, you know, you got your new car. And he goes, yeah, I'm really excited. It's really nice. I said, why don't you get, you know, something even more than that? He goes, well, I got to be careful. You know, the show may not last. Mike, at the very beginning, was quite sure he was going to get fired. Well, in the first season of the show, when the show wasn't doing well in the ratings and NBC wasn't doing well, it was just things were very uncertain. At that time, half-hour comedies were just being canceled right and left. Fox couldn't shake his insecurity, even when the show shifted focus onto his character. Gary began to see that there was comedy in Michael being caught in situations and having to get out of them. OK. All done here. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> You would see when Michael Fox was on, the audience would unconsciously kind of lean forward, you know? And then when he would leave, they didn't even realize. They just kind of unconsciously lean back. So something was happening. Everyone involved realized that Michael Fox was just popping off the screen, and his character was the character that was resonating with America. The show's creator tried to explain the shift to the rest of the cast. And so I thought, well, just got to sit these people down and say what's happened. And I said, this is not the show you signed on to do it. It's not the show I signed on to do, but we have lightning in a bottle, and this show is really going to revolve a lot more around uh, Michael Fox. Yeah, sure, I had some feelings, and I had some, I had some adjusting to do. But I was on a wonderful show, that, and I dearly loved Michael Gross. Um, I loved Fox. I loved the girls. You know, it's, it would be unseemly to stay unhappy too long. With Michael in the spotlight, Family Ties was picked up for a second season, and Fox got a well-deserved bump. Frank Mancuso was running Paramount at that time, and, and he said, this is not the part we hired this kid to do, and we want to recognize what's happening here and improve the deal. Things were also heating up in Michael's personal life. During a promo tour that fall, Fox met a young actress in a similar situation. I was doing uh, Facts of Life on NBC, and he was doing Family Ties, and they used to uh, make, me, make us go to affiliate parties, so we met um, during one of those times. And it was just exciting, because she was in a hit show, and now Mike was in a hit show. Nancy was around a lot. I mean, she was like a fixture. She was, she was there every Friday night. I would go and, and, um, and watch you know, their shows. I often tried to copy something or some of what he did because I just thought he was, he was brilliant. Michael enjoyed his new notoriety. He felt uh, really good that, you know, he came down here, his dad brought him down, and, and uh, it was working out. Things were about to get even better. Steven Spielberg used to come every Friday night, and he was a, a fan. Spielberg was producing a big-budget movie called Back to the Future. Unbeknownst to me, uh, Stephen and Bob Zemeckis had gone to Gary at the beginning of the season and said, we want to use Michael in this movie. And he wanted uh, Michael to play originally in Back to the Future, uh, Marty McFly. But the movie's schedule conflicted with Fox's day job. Goldberg couldn't bring himself to give Michael the news. He said, I don't even want to tell him because I don't want to you know, break his heart, but I can't let him out. Spielberg and director Robert Zemeckis settled on actor Eric Stoltz for the role of Marty McFly. But after several weeks of production, Stoltz wasn't working out. And I get a panicked call from Steven saying, I have to come over, I have to talk to you. And he said, we're shutting down the, the movie. Is there any way we can do it with Michael? And I was so insecure, I thought, God, Gary's calling me for a special meeting in his office. I'm out of here. What did I do? And he said, you know, he said, Stephen wants you to do uh, this movie. So here's the script. Take the script home and, and read it and call him up and tell him what you think. And I picked the script up and held it to my head and said, yeah, OK, I'm, I'm in. The solution to Fox's scheduling conflicts was simple. He'd work on family ties during the day and back to the future at night. He used to, like, sleep in the back of a, um, of a, of a, um, Car. It was a blue station wagon, and they had a bed all laid out for him. And he would work all night on Back to the Future, and then kind of do it in reverse. So maybe he could get an hour of sleep or a couple hours of sleep wherever they were shooting. I, I sensed that he was in a precarious situation. 
Michael did his best to maintain some kind of balance. He was still there as much as he could be and as present as he could be for everyone in, in his life. Me, me included at that point. Michael's family ties castmates were not quite as understanding. It was basically, how is this affecting me? You know, uh, and sometimes I think some of us got a little bit out of shape, a lot of attention, you know, everything being pulled in one direction to make things okay for Michael. I think it was difficult for them to accept the fact from an ego point of view that the show schedule was revolving around him. Michael Gross and I think I'd had some conversations about a little big for his britches. Mm, this is, you know, there's some sense of awkwardness there. But the fact of the matter is that Michael's becoming a movie star was good for the show and ultimately was going to be good for them. But no one knew if it would be good for Fox. Mike would call me and he would go, Gary, you got to help me there. I can't be in two places. He was just being, he was being pulled in too many directions. He got to the point where he was in pretty rough shape. In the spring of 1985, Michael J. Fox juggled two jobs, shooting the lead role in Back to the Future and starring in a hit TV series. I was really tired because I was doing Family Ties and, and, the, and the movie at the same time. I had no idea what I was doing. I thought, God, they're gonna fire me any day. He was tremendously hard on himself if he wasn't up to the creative level he wanted to be. And uh, he had to have it all. He had to have it work. But I know he was really, really tired, but he always managed to have enough energy to be funny and to be wonderful. Do you mind if we park for a while? That's a great idea. I'd love to park. Huh. Well, Marty, I'm almost 18 years old. It's not like I've never parked before. What? On July 3rd, 1985, Back to the Future debuted number one at the box office. America's favorite son became America's favorite movie star. I remember the huge legions of fans, and um, these girls are like, Michael, oh my god! I mean, it was like hanging out with one of the Beatles or something. It was unbelievable. Back to the Future stayed on top for 11 weeks. The success followed Fox to the Family Ties set. When Mike would enter, at the beginning of the show, the people would just go crazy. We had a girl one time uh, climb down and got into Alex's bed before the scene started. And uh, we start the scene and there's this girl in his bed. When we would do the show on a Friday night and people were just killing to try to get in that audience. Michael had the golden touch. A coming of age comedy that he shot the previous summer also opened strong. Teen Wolf was like the biggest independent opening ever. They call me and say, this thing is huge. All of a sudden, you couldn't walk on the street with Michael Fox, and he was getting mobbed. Well, I used to love just going around with him just to see people's reaction when they saw him. I mean, they, just want, they just wanted to touch him. I mean, you know, traffic would, you, they, people do U-turns. Guys would be delivering messages on bike. They'd see him, they'd turn up on the street. He had a great impact on people. People just really, really loved him. He was royalty everywhere he went. And all of a sudden, you're in a situation where you have the top two movies and your TV show is number two. I mean, it is overwhelming. Everyone wanted a piece of the newest hot actor. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> The money started pouring in. Fox bought a home in the Hollywood Hills and a very hot set of wheels. It was like, oh wow, I have a Ferrari now. I have a big house and I can do anything I want. He was definitely um, enjoying the availability of life's uh, pleasures. That's like this 24-year-old lottery winner. But the grueling schedule was tough on Fox's relationship with Nancy McKeon. It changes your world completely. It changes how you live. It changes 
uh, certainly the time you have for other things. I'm not sure how much perspective he had on where he fit into the world. We would sit on, along the curb um, on the Paramount sound stages and talking about the insecurities. He said, you know, it's a weird thing being in my position because I want to be able to call up my you know, friends, and, and he felt like there was really no one to call because, you know, they're going to say, well, so what? You're Michael J. Fox. That's a strange kind of isolation, you know? He would hide a lot. He would literally get smaller, that he would literally just shrink. Everyone else is going, oh, you're, you're the biggest, you're the best, and everyone else is falling on you and taking your picture everywhere you go, and how do you keep some sense of yourself? It's a kind of a natural thing that happens, and... In Hollywood, you know, you can fall into this kind of bubble where you're not really uh, experiencing the real world. In my mind, someone was coming to the door any day, banging on the door saying, you know, give it back. And I thought, well, I'm going to be drunk when they get here. Alcohol seemed like an easy escape. He loved beer, and he used to drink a lot of beer. One night, he and I we were just drinking like a million beers, and... You know, he, he was just drinking me under the table. He lived uh, kind of fast in some ways. Mike picked up early on. He said, you know, sometimes uh, because of who you are and what you do, you know, you don't have to pay the price. I was like a little prince, and, and I could get away with anything. Almost anything. When a New York theater actress named Tracy Pollan was hired to play Alex's love interest, she didn't hold back. Tracy was not like the other girls. She was not fawning on him. She was very, you know, tough. One day she came back from lunch, and I, I guess she had, you know, she had pasta or something for lunch, and, and it had garlic. So she walked in, and I said, and I just said something. I just said, I said, uh, I said, well, scampy for lunch or what? And she said, you were the rudest son of a bitch I've ever met. And then, like, walked away, and I just went, oh. I love this woman. Who is this girl? The on-set connection between Michael and Tracy was undeniable. You come on like some obnoxious guy. And <laughs> underneath that, there's this wide-eyed child, completely innocent and naive. Oh. Is that uh, sort of a compliment? <laughs> when Mike was in those scenes, she brought him up, you know. He did feel like she raised the bar for him. She was just so good, I mean, really, really good. And it was because of the quality of her work, you know. We wouldn't let me get away with a lot of stuff that I normally did, and I had to kind of buckle down and really work. To Michael, it seemed like she represented a lot of things that maybe he didn't think he was or he had. Uh, I think he viewed her as somebody who was like really classy. He thought that maybe she was smarter than he was. There was chem there was chemistry there, and it wasn't there was nothing uh, there was nothing nothing screen oriented about it. It was real. I just remember in my mind thinking, God, they would really look good together as a couple. But romance was out of the question. Michael had been involved with, with Nancy, and um, Tracy was with Kevin Bacon at the time, and we were both. Well, Tracy much more seriously than me. We were both seeing other people. Um, but I definitely had a crush on her. It just wasn't the right time or the right moment in time, and uh, they filed it away. He had a lot of big things happening to him, and, and he was just kind of, it was all huge at the time. So I was kind of just trying to stay as far away from that as I could, because I was a little bit overwhelmed by it. After seven episodes of Family Ties, Pollan decided to leave the show to pursue theater work in New York. At the end of one of her last days on set, Tracy handed Michael a cassette as he was driving off the studio lot. Fox popped in the tape and cranked up the volume. She played me this song, the James Taylor song, but that's why I'm here. It seems they're not to burn, need to turn on a dime. Walk on if you're walking, even if it's an uphill climb. Walk on if you're walking, even if it's an uphill climb. Try to remember that working's no crime, just don't let him take and waste your time. You can only go so long with having the good times and not getting your proper rest. And what Tracy did was was help him realize that, you know, you're good, but you could be better if, if maybe you took care of yourself. Now she was real with him, which is what he needed.
After four seasons of family ties and a couple of smash movies, Michael J. Fox was sitting on top of the acting world. Then, at the 1986 Emmy Awards, Michael's peers recognized his work. And the winner is Michael J. Fox, Family Ties. I don't believe this. This is great. I feel four feet tall. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, okay. I gotta, I gotta get it straight, okay. Um, thank you, Academy. Uh, this is unbelievable. This is great. You know, I, the first thing that I thought of to say was, I feel four feet tall, which is, a, <laughs> you know, which is a funny joke, but at the same time, too, I think was just an admission on my part that there's no way anyone can measure up to this. And also, I want to thank my family at home in uh, beautiful Vancouver. Mom, Dad, I love you. I got the telegram. It made me cry. This is cool. Thank you all. When he won it and said hi to all of us, of course, there was a bucket load of tears going on all over the place. To have, have that moment up there and to be able to say whatever is important to you in your heart is, is a really special, special thing. And it was just so great to see people understand the level of his, of his talent. It was, uh, it was definitely a big moment in his career. But as 1986 came to a close, Fox's relationship with Nancy McKeon also came to an end. You don't always get to spend the amount of time with people that you would, you would like to. And, um, you know, so for us, it just kind of, it, it moved into, you know, a, an amazing lifelong friendship. Single and with an Emmy in his pocket, Fox kicked it into overdrive. I'm sure it was like, okay, you know, you guys, you guys uh, acknowledge that and you recognize that I'm, you know, want to show you that, you know, this wasn't a fluke. He pursued his acting career the way he played hockey. You know, there was that, that pushing, pu I'm going to push myself harder, I'm going to try to do more. That included more roles in big budget films. In 1987, Fox signed on to play a destructive young man in the druggy drama Bright Lights Big City. The cast included Kiefer Sutherland, Phoebe Cates, Swoozie Kurtz, and another familiar face. Sorry I'm so late. Oh, it's OK. I was just looking around. This is a great book story. That was the next time, you know, we saw each other. I said, you know, how's, how's your boyfriend doing? And she said, actually, we broke up. And I said, what are you doing for lunch? <laughs> Ted is a hell of a guy. Tell you, you gotta admire his his style, you know, his joie de vivre, his savoir faire, his, his, his sprezzatura. He's not necessarily a man for a heart to heart, but he, he's been a good friend to me at a time of need, and and he's generous in his own careless way. You know, you two very close. I think he's an ass. Exactly. We were both single at the time, and that's when we started dating. And he always talked about how great she is. He he thought she was the one. From the get-go. I met Tracy in, in time and knowing her and falling in love with her, I got to a point where I would step in front of a train for her. This time, Michael wasn't going to let Pollen get away. I tossed the box at her with the ring in it. I think I'm like, here. I mean, you know, I'm not very good at those moments. Um, I think I, I think I was pretty awkward about it. I, yeah, I kind of did one of those. I kind of, yeah, you want to do this? <laughs> Oh, she said yes. I mean, he did have a nice ring. <laughs> it really was, you know, um, it was it, it was nice. It was it was a gift that she came back, you know, into my life. And it's just one of those things. You know, be patient. Michael also had to be patient with his career. Bright Lights, Big City was a box office disappointment. If Fox was going to prove himself as a serious actor, he needed a serious hit. The Vietnam drama Casualties of War, directed by heavyweight Brian De Palma, seemed like the perfect candidate. The whole movie's about what happens to a guy that just basically got there and sees all these things going on. How does he react? Well, I wanted to get a contemporary uh, figure that kids identify with, that kids like, uh, that uh, has a certain amount of integrity. Uh, and I wanted to have them see this war through that, through that kid's eyes. Michael wanted to try something that would push him to, uh, into, in a, into a different area of his brain. And Casualties of War was a, was a remarkable opportunity to do that. When word got out that Michael joined the cast alongside Sean Penn, Hollywood was buzzing.
You think you're standing up to me? Ah! I do remember the expectation that the film was going to take him to another place. It was a remarkable group of people in the sense that um, you had Michael, you had Sean Penn, Brian De Palma was at the height of his game. I mean, it was just a, it was like a really a confluence of really talented people making an important movie. But on location in the jungles of Thailand, the chemistry turned toxic. It was 115 degrees. We were all sick. We hated each other. We wanted to go home. Uh, we were incredibly tired and incredibly homesick. And everyone, I've never seen such desperation of people wanting to get out of there and wanting to get done. Then, in the middle of production, Fox got a terrifying call from back home. Tracy told Michael that a fan was sending disturbing letters, threatening to kill both of them if they refused to end their relationship. There was some woman who was uh, a little bit off a rocker who felt like Tracy was a threat to uh, Michael. <laughs> It was a it was a very it was un extraordinarily unpleasant episode. It really was. What, what what was going on back here was very difficult for him. After shooting wrapped in Southeast Asia, Michael raced home. On July 16th, 1988, he and Tracy headed to Vermont to get married. We tried to make it as kind of subtle as possible. So we just had a group of friends and our closest family all get together. And Their wedding was I mean it was extremely private. Um, you know, they wanted it that way. They, they wanted just really family and a few close friends. Until a few uninvited guests showed up. I remember approaching the, uh, uh, the inn that, uh, in Vermont where the wedding was and going across a bridge with all kinds of the, the media on either side. I thought, holy smokes, uh, I wonder what the deal is. And I saw the helicopters in the fields. I had no idea that uh, all this stuff was uh, to cover Mike's wedding. This was a big, you know, in inquirer-like event. You got people pretending to be some somebody they're not to try and get pictures. I mean, trying to become staff members and, uh, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Word was out and they were really watching. There's the noise of the helicopters over top all the time and, and trying to get people in and out of the inn without giving anything away. It was bizarre. I mean, it... The wedding became almost as much about evading the uh, paparazzi as it did about, you know, them getting hitched. Despite all the distractions, Michael was able to stay focused on what mattered. The minute he got married, he was sort of, you know, he was a different guy. You know, he wanted to take on that responsibility. One month after the ceremony, Michael and Tracy announced that Pollen was pregnant. He was really ready to settle down and start a family with Tracy, and he was extremely excited about being a father, and, and you could tell that he, he was ready for it. In the fall of 1988, Michael J. Fox looked forward to both a beginning and an end. Michael's wife, Tracy, was pregnant with the couple's first child, and the TV series Family Ties began taping its final season. You're a pure temple, and I can't believe you won't let us Michael was growing up, and so was Alex P. Keaton. Gary felt that it was time that maybe the character of Alex was getting a little old to be in the house, and he knew that if you moved him out of the house that the show wouldn't work. Saying goodbye was hard. We were coming to an end, so it was really a very emotional time for everybody. The months leading up to the end of the show were not great for Michael. The episodes just weren't that good and and also it just it was time for him to move to another level as an actor. Universal was ready with an offer. The studio behind Back to the Future wanted a sequel to the box office smash. It had to be bigger and better and bolder and you know it had to be all of the things that sequels are supposed to be. And they were there was no such thing as spending too much money because the first one had been so successful. Originally, we were only going to shoot the second movie, but the script was really big, and they decided to expand it to two movies. And they made us what they thought was the most magnificent offer they could possibly imagine, and it was, frankly, laughable. And um, it, was, it was a very hard, arduous, difficult negotiation. Michael probably made a lot of money on two or three. They ended up paying him more than they wanted to or thought they would have to, but it was fair, and we made a fair deal, and he did both movies. Filming for the sequels started in early 1989. Meanwhile, ominous letters from a deranged fan continued to arrive in the mail. 
The newest threats included Michael and Tracy's unborn child. He had bodyguards and had all that stuff that he had to do to protect himself, you know, and, and the family. On February 3rd, 1989, police traced the letters to a 26-year-old woman. In her house, authorities found the typewriter where she wrote an estimated 5,000 notes to Michael and his wife. The woman later pled guilty to making terrorist threats and was ordered to stay away from Fox and his family. Then, in April 1989, Family Ties filmed its final episode. My recollection of the last week on the show was a supreme disappointment because they gave us a script. It was nothing that seemed worthy of the culmination of seven years. We all had talked about it being too important and we were being let down by the show. We literally did not have a couple of the scenes written until Friday night. That's how completely crippled everybody was. And then when we came in on the final day and they had a killer script. The theme of it, Alex leaving, just played into what everybody was dealing with. Look, this is a very big deal here. I'm, I'm not just going across the street. I'm picking my whole life up, and I'm taking it to New York. I remember that he is packing to go away to school, and he's excited he's going to New York. And ah, they had me singing, sing to him, angry, start spreading the news. Today, because if it were me, if it were me, it would break my heart. It would tear me up. Well, don't you know how hard it is for me? I I realized I hated so much that I was saying goodbye to this guy. And I just went over to her and I, I put my arms around her and she said to me, she said, I'm so sorry. And I said, for what? She said, because I made this difficult. And I made it difficult because I never knew for real what it is we had. Michael was just such a presence to me. And and maybe going back to those, the time when I, I would pick him up, it was just the arc of where we'd gone, where we started, where we went to. We did the last scene of the show, and it was a thing where I knew that the scene was clean, that is, that we didn't have to do any pickups. So I went, I went backstage, and an AD was there, and he handed me a beer. And I took the beer, and I took a sip of it, and then I heard, that's a wrap. And like a sip of beer went down my throat and like my eyes just opened up and tears started to come down. Standing next to Michael, we're taking our bows at the end. Well, I think we both just put our arms around each other and wept. And I cried because I think then, because I was really young and it, and it was like I was leaving home or something and what was out in the world and I didn't know what was out in the world. And I had a wife and a baby on the way and I'm leaving this thing. Michael, you know, had started on the show as like a kid, and he was ending the show as a man. And I think when you look at that, it's kind of hard to reconcile. You know, the old fears come up. I mean, is ever going to be as good as this? On May 30th, 1989, it was pretty good. Tracy gave birth to a baby boy, Sam Michael Fox. He was so happy about that, and he just was. And he just was on top of the world. There was more to celebrate. Early reviews for Casualties of War raved about Michael's dramatic gifts. Yeah, I've never been around reviews like that in my life. They were, they were really incredible. But when the movie opened, the buzz didn't translate to the box office. The film made a disappointing $5 million opening weekend. It was really tough on him to find that, uh, you know, things like Casualties of War and uh, Bright Lights, Big City and, and Light of Day weren't getting what he felt were a, were a fair shake. It was disappointing, and we moved on. That's not to say that we moved on overnight. That's not to say that there wasn't pain and anguish and unhappiness about the whole thing. He was terrific as a <clears throat> dramatic actor. And sometimes it's hard, like, if people want to watch you and laugh, you know, it's hard to bust out of that. Michael proved that when Back to the Future Part Two debuted at number one in November. The sequel brought in more than $27 million opening weekend. Then, on January 6th, Fox got a call that his dad was in the hospital. Michael caught the next flight to Vancouver, but Bill Fox passed away before he got there. 
My son was born six months before my dad died. So it's really weird because finally you get what your dad did because all of a sudden you're in the same position. So you want to go, now I get it. Wait a minute, I want to talk to you. And he was gone. He sure loved his dad a lot. And it, was, it really devastated him when that happened. And that was a really difficult time for me. And so it took me a while to regroup from that. The summer of 1990 was a good one for 29-year-old Michael J. Fox. He cherished time with his wife Tracy and young son Sam in their new home on the East Coast. Back to the Future Part 3 opened huge and was well on its way to earning more than $200 million. That fall, director Michael Caton Jones pitched his film Doc Hollywood to Fox. I met Michael and I really liked him. We got on with, within 20 minutes we decided we should do this film. The movie shot in Florida, which meant time away from Tracy and Sam. But Fox made the deal, in part because he got to pal around with his buddy, co-star Woody Harrelson. We were in a, a parking lot outside of some bar. We got into, you know, this slap boxing, you know, which we used to do sometimes. So I, I guess I got in a couple of good swats, and he was not <laughs> resting until he even scored. And man, we were all over that parking lot, up on top of cars, you know, with his boundless energy. He's not going to let up. He's like a bull terror. The morning after the impromptu throwdown, Michael noticed something strange. He woke up, and I think he had a finger twitching or something, like his pinky. It just kept twitching, you know, but he wasn't doing it. And it was just some weird kind of nervous reaction he didn't know what it was had a couple of beverages the night before so you know i wasn't really thinking clearly about it at all um but I, I i knew that something was happening i didn't really know what it was it was you know half alarming and half amusing just to be sure fox saw a local doctor he gave me a few tests he said well at your age you know he said there's nothing neurological that i can imagine it would be he said you probably whack your elbow michael went back to work in the summer of 1991, Doc Hollywood was a major hit. To celebrate, the actor took his family on a much-needed vacation to Martha's Vineyard. My wife saw me jogging one day, and I was really kind of lopsided, and my left side was, was obviously not functioning uh, normally. So she urged me to go to a doctor. This time, the doctor's news was terrifying. And that was when the neurologist uh, gave me some tests and said that, that it, was, it was Parkinson's. The first symptom you see for a lot of patients is a shaking tremor in one of their hands. I remember him telling me, and I was just like, wow. It's like that old cliche of you think you know, that could happen to anybody else, but you know, it doesn't happen to you or your friend, you know? I had a lot of denial, and I had a lot of, um, and I had a lot of panic, and I had a lot of negotiation. I was heavy into negotiation. I was heavy into thinking, there's got to be a way out of this. There's got to be a way that I can do something or manipulate this in some way. It was devastating news. I mean, men that age don't have that happen to them. I wouldn't say that I was devastated. I was very shocked and surprised. And when I think of that moment when I told her, and she didn't panic. She didn't draw back. And you just go, you are in this with me for the long haul, aren't you? And I could just tell immediately that she was. And then it was like, OK, we'll deal with it. Michael decided no one other than family and close friends would know about his illness. He certainly made a decision, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping this to myself, and, and I'm going to do what I can to keep it to myself and not have a, anybody that I don't want to know know what's going on with me. Like a knife fight in a dark closet, you know, I just, um, it wasn't something I expected anyone else to understand. I, I felt it was a personal battle. His concern was that instead of just being treated like Michael J. Fox, it'll be treated like Michael J. Fox with Parkinson. I certainly had a fear of pity, uh, because pity, pity can be a step away from abuse, you know, and it's not something I'm comfortable with. He just isn't a person that, that wants pity of any sort. I thought, well, it's really purely only my business. Doctors told Michael he could expect to be able to work for another 10 years. With his secret safe, Michael signed an eight-figure multi-picture contract with Universal Studios. In terms of my career, there was, I'm going to take advantage of everything I can now, make as much money as I can now, do as many films as I can now, because I had been pretty much given this, this deadline of 10 years. 
The first movie of the New Deal was For Love or Money. The pressure brought back some old habits. There was a gradation in his level of alcohol intake. It escalated. I was drinking, just being alone drinking, and just kind of get away from it and not look at it and not deal with it. He just internalized everything and just pretended that it was going to go away. And uh, obviously, it wasn't going to go away. And he was not really handling it properly. It was leading him down a path that, that you know, was nowhere. One night, after a long day of filming for Love or Money, Michael tied one on. I didn't have the night before, and I'd woken up on the couch, and I'm all sweaty. And I looked down at the floor, and I saw Tracy's feet. I did this slow pan up and expected to get to her face and see her very upset at me. And I didn't. I saw her just kind of uh, exhausted and disgusted with it. You know, she's basically saying, is this going to be your reaction to this? And I, and I sensed that, that I sensed that that I needed to have a different reaction to it, that this was not the way to deal with this. Something clicked. Fox decided to get help. I started therapy. I really got to a point where, where in not looking at the fact that I had the disease, um, I had shut everything off. So until I dealt with that, I couldn't go forward. He transitioned from being a boy in a bubble to being a man in the real world, really. He did step up and just took responsibility for a, a lot of things. Michael also pursued state-of-the-art treatment for Parkinson's. Doctors prescribed powerful medication that helped keep the disease in check. He took certain drugs that stopped the shaking. Fox was able to keep working, but for love or money, greedy, and life with Mikey were all disappointments at the box office. The movies didn't work. Agents put clients in movies um, and have to take responsibility um, with some frequency for, for failure. The actor decided it was time for a change. I've never been fired by a client in a classier way. He went to the Creative Artists Agency because they represented a lot of movie stars, and you know he hoped that they would uh, be better at picking movies for him. Michael knew how to push his career forward, but nothing could stop the relentless progress of his disease. Constantly, I'm having to add more to my repertoire of little, you know, sleight of hand and little tricks, um, more and more. And there were, you know, other things. Uh, movement was affected. A certain rigidity, uh, expression. My grandfather had Parkinson's, so when we talked about it at first, I, you know, I knew exactly what it meant and and what was in store. It's. Uh, uh, a process of cell death in, in the brain in where there, uh, a chemical is produced, a, a neuron called, uh, called dopamine, which is the chemical that basically your brain uses to communicate to your body any signals of movement. In fact, by the time uh, you get your first symptoms, they say that as much as 80% of those cells are dead. In the early 90s, Michael J. Fox worked on a string of movies and continued his secret battle against Parkinson's disease. Then on February 15, 1995, Michael got some very happy news. His wife Tracy gave birth to twin daughters, Akina and Skylar. That April, Michael traveled to New Zealand to film The Frighteners with director Peter Jackson. The separation was tough on Fox. His family was growing. It was much more important to him to be at home. Instead of partying with the cast and crew after work, Michael holed up in his hotel room and watched TV. He was down in New Zealand working on this film, and uh, Tracy was sending him cassettes of Seinfeld and Frasier and Friends, shows that he really wasn't that familiar with. Fox watched the tapes with more than casual interest. It really made him jealous to watch those other actors doing these shows the way that he knew he still could. And so he made the decision that when he came back to the United States, he was going to pursue a television project. And I decided to come back to television, get a, here in New York where we live, um, get a regular job, regular hours, and really be able to be near my doctors, and most importantly, be near my family. He wanted to figure out what else he could do. So the directing, the producing, all played into that. And he had a lot of money, but I think he was thinking, well, what if it all goes away? How am I going to provide for my family? I remember just having a conversation with him about, you know, um, television and, and, um, and how much he missed that live audience experience. At DreamWorks, Jeffrey Katzenberg was already working with the producer on development. 
Michael's TV godfather, Gary David Goldberg. So, so Gary, what would you think about maybe, uh, you know, hooking up with Michael? And uh, he just sort of exploded at the idea. Oh my goodness, that would be too good to imagine. And Katzenberg, being Katzenberg, next thing I know, I'm on a Gulf Stream heading to New York with Bill Lawrence, a young writer, and we're going to meet Mike. And we actually have no idea what the show is going to be. Michael wasn't really sure that he and Gary were going to collaborate well together because their relationship on Family Ties had been so father and son at that time. But I think Michael was um, curious to see how this might work. We come up with the idea of politics, and uh, we wrote this pilot in four days. As they would finish scenes, they would fax it through to Michael, and he was pulling the pages off the fax machine at home and laughing as he read and knowing that this was indeed the show for him. The show was Spin City. Fox signed on as an executive producer and star, playing the deputy mayor of New York City. Production started in the spring of 1996. Fox continued to keep his illness a secret. Michael felt it was really important to keep that information um, just among that close and guarded group. The only people that knew at that point were his doctors, his close family, and um, the the absolute top level of the network and the and the studio. He said, "I don't want anybody's sympathy. I don't want anybody feeling sorry for me. I'm a pro. I will show up and I will do my job." Spin City premiered in the fall of 1996 and quickly became a network hit. Hey, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can't, there's a trash strike going on. You can't throw that out. It's the core. <laughs> so that's good. That's fiber. You can eat that. Go eat. Eat. Go. The fans' love of the show was totally based on their love of Michael J. Fox. It was, hey, Michael's back. It's like an old friend that you haven't seen in a long time. And, and wow, look how good and how funny he is. It's, it's, been, it's been like walking into a hug. You know? It's really been great. And the first time, the people weren't going, hey, Alex, or hey, Marty McFly. They were going, hey, Mike Flaherty. Spin City continued to be a solid performer for ABC. But the once sweet relationship between Michael and Gary turned sour. Michael wanted one thing, and Gary had to step aside in order for Michael to, to achieve it. Well, in, in the scene, Mike has to A, B, Mike Flaherty, but B, B, the executive producer. That was hard for him, it was hard for me. I was most comfortable, more comfortable, not sharing a vision, you know? But um, that was the agreement we had made. There was clearly friction, and there was no question, and, um, uh, and from time to time, I found myself as a marriage counselor in, in, in the relationship. I also felt that his relationship with Gary sometimes was problematic because Mike had anger about his father being gone and anger about being sick and it had to go somewhere. Goldberg and Fox worked out their issues. At the same time, the demands of a weekly series forced Michael to pay extra close attention to his treatment. Stop, stop, stop. The medication that he'd been prescribed has to be perfectly timed in order for him uh, not to be symptomatic on camera. And there were times when you couldn't shoot because Mike wasn't ready. And there was really nothing you could do, and it was very frustrating to him. I had a big turn on my left side, and I would just, I'd just get so angry at him. Not, not, at, not at God, not at myself, not at anything else, but I'd just be like, you unreasonable son of a, you know, what can I do here? We used to curse him because he would hold up shooting for so long, and we used to go, oh, come on. But he has to get ready, and you think we don't get ready? We work up our energy so that at 7 o'clock, we can go out there and give it our best. And all of a sudden now, it's 20 after 8. Where the hell is he? Come on. I couldn't do things on their schedule. Because when you have Parkinson's, it's really a matter of how your, your medication goes. Everybody had to be ready so that if Mike was available, you had to go, OK, now, back in that scene, Let's shoot the scene with Mike here. Forget everything else we're doing. You, had a, you would drop everything, and people thought he was being a little bit of a prima donna. These few occasions where he wasn't ready um, was slightly suspicious because it just is so unlike him. Riding in a limo in early 98, Michael nearly blew his cover on his way to an awards ceremony. If you're walking into the Golden Globes, 
I guarantee you, at any given moment, 150 to 200 people are looking at you. So that the pressure of that moment, if I, if I was feeling symp symptomatic, which I was, and my arm was, was tremoring and my, my leg was tremoring, and uh, I didn't want to get out and walk through that gauntlet. So I, you know, I said to the guy, you know, Let's go around the block. Let's go around the block. So he, I don't know what he thought was going on back there, but he, I, Tracy was massaging my shoulder. Maybe he thought, you know, have a little fun on the way to the Golden Globe. Michael finally pulled it together and ended up taking home the Globe for his work on Spin City. But back on the set, people kept asking questions. Michael had um, been bitten by a tick, and so when there first started to be a few rumors that there was. Um, something physically wrong. He was able to truthfully announce that yes, indeed, he was suffering from Lyme disease. He would say, well, I'm on, you know, I'm on medication for Lyme disease, and so, you know, that tires me out. He knew that in order for him to continue to work on Spin City, he was going to have to do something about what was becoming an increasingly difficult tremor for him to control. Doctors suggested a surgery called a thalamotomy. The operation destroys a tiny area of the brain called the thalamus that controls some involuntary movements. It was not a cure for the disease, but would hopefully lessen the tremors. Michael settled on, um, uh, on getting the surgery, and once he makes a decision, he, he rarely second guesses himself. Fox also decided it was time to tell the cast and crew the truth. He gathered everybody uh, uh, in the bleachers, every cameraman, uh, craft service, every writer, everybody, and said, I have Parkinson's. It was tears, and there was disbelief, and, and there was a lot of, oh, that's what it is. And then, oh, that's just horrible. We had no idea that he was in pain, that he was suffering, that he couldn't move, that his muscles were tightening up on him. He, he was suffering inside, and we never knew that. Michael went out of his way to reassure the team. He didn't want anyone else to be worried about their livelihoods. The show was going to go on. He knew what the consequences were of his being sick. So you got 60 people who were all employed because of one man. And the minute he says, I'm done, everybody's unemployed. In the spring of 1998, Michael J. Fox divided his time between working on the hit show Spin City and his battle against Parkinson's. In March, he entered the hospital for a risky operation to try and ease some of the shaking associated with the disease. The surgery was a success, but it was becoming more difficult for Michael to conceal his condition from the world. It was just a question of time you know, before some newspaper or magazine decided to run uh, the information. This was going to become public. You know, the best thing in the world he could do was tell his own story. He wanted to have control of the announcement. He didn't want it to appear on page six. I thought, well, I'll do kind of a two-prong attack. I'll tell Barbara Walters and People Magazine, and everybody in the whole wide world will know. Michael J. Fox's people contacted me and said, we have something to tell you about that's a big secret. I had no idea what it was. But People Magazine's website broke the story early, and the rest of the media jumped all over it. Michael J. Fox has made a stunning admission that he has been struggling with Parkinson's disease. Michael, all this week we have been reading and hearing that you have this devastating disease, that it is life-threatening, that you are in the fight for your life. Is this the way you feel? It's, it's, it, no, it doesn't represent the way I feel. I found myself at seven years not battling it, not struggling with it, not suffering from it, not breaking under the burden of it, but dealing with it. When Michael uh, went public with his diagnosis, he'd gone through the shock and the sadness and finally the settling in um, and the recognition that this is something that he was going to have to live with. My last fear was the audience. I thought, you know, will the audience be able to laugh if they know that I'm sick? Can you laugh at someone who's sick and not feel like an a-hole? God bless Michael Fox for being so good at what he did that even after two or three weeks of the country knowing that he was ill, he still was confident enough to go and make people comfortable that they're watching a pro. What are you saying? You're saying you, you, you don't want to go out tonight? You know how much this means to me. 
Oh, calm down, Mike. No, I won't. I won't. I won't. <laughs> now, 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 you, you, you never want to go out anymore. All you want to do is sit here in front of this damn TV and pretend I don't even exist. Now, another thing. How come you always get the remote? Because I'm the mayor. Oh, don't you, because I'm the mayor, me. <laughs> he knew what he had to do to get the job done. Even if he was nervous about doing these shows in front of the public, certainly didn't show it. I mean, we didn't stop doing live shows, you know. We didn't stop going out on the street. Now to know that he was able to be uh, such, a, such a gifted comedic actor under such difficult and very unfunny circumstances was was really appreciated by his fans. If you look back through the annals of uh, television history, you probably would not find a situation that unique and someone who, uh, you know, was even able to do that. That was, that was amazing. As Spin City rolled out season four, Michael brought in Heather Locklear to give the show a new twist. I, I was looking, frankly, for someone who could carry some of the workload for me. One of many things I think that are very, very, very hard about Parkinson is, is that uh, how tiring it is, um, physically debilitating it is. He was starting to feel a, a little bit more weary um, with what he was putting his body through on a weekly basis. Fox couldn't control his day-to-day -day symptoms, but he was determined to fight the disease. The outpouring of affection from his fans was one of the things that really led to him deciding to start his own Parkinson's Foundation. He, he just immediately was sort of engrossed in the idea of I've had the most incredible life and I've been a very lucky guy and I'm going to be a spokesman uh, for this. The more public awareness he had for his role in Spin City, ultimately the more public awareness he would bring to his organization and to the fight for cure for Parkinson's disease. It was just a great opportunity. It was just a fantastic opportunity, and I couldn't see anything that could be as important as stepping into this now. Finding a cure for Parkinson's disease. Frankly, I hope I'm out of work within 10 years, because that's how fast scientists feel they may crack this thing. So go to my website and see what you can do. Together, we just might wipe out PD this decade. OK, well, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Thank you for your support. It was a, it's a difficult disease to talk about and to deal with him. And um, he put a face on it that was um, accessible. You know, it wasn't just your grandfather. You know, it was this accessible, ingenuous young man who was now, uh, you know, on his own crusade for the good of, of, of all mankind. He was going to take the flag now and carry this forward, the torch of, you know, of driving people to focus on this and, and to bring attention to it and shine a light on it and go to Congress and raise money. Michael made several trips to Congress uh, to advocate for research freedom issues. What I understood very clearly is that the time for quietly soldiering on is through. The war against Parkinson's is a winnable war, and I have resolved to play a role in that victory. As Michael fought the war on Parkinson's, he was losing his own battle to continue working. There became a point where he just, you know, he couldn't get out there and, you know, and be himself. I don't think anyone realized how rapidly it would escalate. As the disease progressed, that was one of his great heartaches, is that it? It, it was more and more difficult for him to uh, keep control of that instinct, uh, that thing that he had that was so brilliant. Uh, um, I'm sure it got more and more difficult to, to, to learn lines and to, to retain them. People can't laugh if, if they're seeing you shake, uh, or if you can't give your best, or if subliminally you are appearing weak and vulnerable. And we went on vacation down the Caribbean. I went snorkeling and I saw a turtle and I followed the turtle around for like a half an hour. It was just, I wasn't thinking about anything, but where, where was the turtle going? And, and then I, I got out of the water and I took off my stuff and I put, I put on the towel beside Tracy and said, I'm done, that's it. When he told me that he had made the decision to retire, I just burst into tears. It shocked me when I realized that he couldn't go on anymore, you know? When he was diagnosed, his doctor had told him that he could work for another 10 years 
um, at age 29, and it was pretty much 10 years to the day. At that moment, it was the end of his acting era. Michael kept his promise to the cast and crew that the show would go on. Producers hired Charlie Sheen and planned to move the series to L.A. But first, they had to shoot the 100th episode, Michael's final show. All smiling, all smiling, all smiling, okay? Here we are with our cake. You guys are so great with the cake. I see three cakes. During that last week, I think for everyone, the, the sympathy that everyone had for him and the sorrow that they weren't themselves going to be able to enjoy his talent and the joy of working with him every week was just really just incredibly sad. I mean, I, I cry now even thinking about it. it. We just went through boxes of Kleenex. Okay, well, uh, see you later. Uh, Stuart, Caitlin. Uh, Paul! <laughs> yeah, that's right, Paul. <laughs> it became about so much more than just a final episode of a, of a TV series. You know, it, it became... It became about Michael's history and, and future. It was just, just so tremendously touching and um, I think just so well done, so classy, and just so perfect for Michael. During award season, Hollywood agreed. And the Emmy goes to, oh wow, this is even more nerve wracking than anything else, okay. Michael J. Fox, Spin City. When Michael won the Emmy, it, it had nothing to do with Parkinson's disease, and it had everything to do with Parkinson's disease. And I just want to say uh, uh, to you people at home, wherever the camera is, thanks. It's, it's been a great ride, and, um, and, you know, stay tuned. Thanks a lot. After more than 20 years of nonstop work in film and television, Michael J. Fox switched gears in the fall of 2000. Fox said goodbye to Spin City to concentrate full time on his new foundation and finding a cure for Parkinson's disease. It was now time to use his creativity and his intelligence and his heart uh, for something you know larger than himself. And I think he saw that as a challenge that was predestined. Mike set up his foundation primarily to, to raise money to find different solutions to help cure the disease and, and find younger, maybe younger scientists and doctors that, you know, that, that have uh, different ideas about maybe trying to get this thing under control and cured. And he said, I want you to know that this is uh, the first organization that was ever founded with the idea of going out of business as soon as possible. For his efforts in fighting the disease, Michael accepted the Citizen of the Year Award from George Magazine. We're blessed that Michael has decided to take the lead in this important pressing cause. The respect and admiration that we already had for him as an artist is only heightened and compounded by his advocacy. Once again, I say, for of those to whom much is given, much is required. Michael J. Fox has heeded this call to service. In accepting the award, Michael remembered back to when his wife-to-be gave him a very special message. Tracy uh, uh, played this song for me a long time ago when I was a, a, just an idiot youth, uh, being a fool, and, and, and it applied then. And, and yet, now, I, I always go to these words because they, they mean so much more to me now. Uh, one of the sections of it says, uh, learn not to burn means to turn on a dime. Walk on if you're walking, if, even if it's an uphill climb. Try to remember that working's no crime. Just don't let them take and waste your time. That's why I'm here. Thank you. In 2001, Michael and Tracy welcomed their fourth child into the world. My name's Esme. 
Esme Annabelle and Tracy's great. Did a fantastic job. The kids are really excited. It certainly spoke volumes of where they were as a, you know, as a couple and where they wanted to go in the future. Mike's family is uh, the most important thing in his life to him. He holds his, uh, his children at the center of his life and, and wants to uh, bring them up uh, as normal as possible, I guess, under the circumstances. His young family kept Fox focused on the future. Our foundation was also very interested in looking at what role, if any, stem cells, embryonic, human embryonic stem cells in particular, might be able to play in helping find a cure for Parkinson's disease. Stem cells is a very big possibility and a very big part of it. We, I don't like to, to rule out anything. To get the word out, Michael joined forces with the most famous fighter in history, three-time world heavyweight boxing champion, Muhammad Ali. The only other real celebrity um, who at that time had, had um, publicly acknowledged that he had Parkinson's was, was Muhammad Ali. He asked if you wish to challenge him. No, that's, uh, there's no ropes for me to lay against. Uh, no, no, I, I'm, I'm happy to be in this corner, not, not on the other side. The foundation began throwing a yearly fundraiser where friends and colleagues came out to show their support. The work that Michael J. Fox Foundation is doing is so important, uh, obviously. I mean, those, uh, to raise money and awareness, first of all, and to raise the money for research. It's very important what's going on right now. So, you know, I, I can help change my friend's life and the life of millions of other people just like him. Well, I'm not surprised at the turnout uh, or of what he does, because if he sets his mind to something, it gets done. The reaction has been amazing. And, and what I love about it is that so how, how quickly it went right into action. And people not only are showing support for me, but really getting involved and, and, and pushing this along. Michael was on a mission. He took the fight to Washington, DC. He did a very brave thing, which was go in front of Congress without having taken his medicine and show them what this disease really did. I'm here to tell you that administering a successful research program is not rocket science. It's mostly common sense and the will to get things done. And we're going to get this done. This subcommittee, this Congress, and the NIH have the opportunity to make it happen in time for many more people today living with Parkinson's. Thank you. Oh, to me, oof, you know, it's impossible to even try to imagine the level of courage that takes to do that. That's, that's huge. In 2002, Fox opened his life to the public again when he published his memoir. Here's a guy at the top, and then he has this disease, and gosh, you know, that's going to be uncomfortable reading about and, and yet, it's the most uplifting book, one of the most uplifting books I've ever read in my life. Lucky Man sold more than 700,000 copies and spent 17 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. He often says to patients that um, he's not Michael J. Fox, less what Parkinson's has taken from him, but alternatively, he's Michael J. Fox plus what Parkinson's has brought to him. And I think in some ways, that's what he's getting at. Even with a diagnosis of Parkinson's, he's a very lucky man. That December, Michael received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The first time I, I came to, to Hollywood, which is 1979, my father, uh, uh, who's since passed away, brought me down here. And I just thought, I thought it was so fitting, and, and I was really moved that that this uh, star uh, ended up being so close to that because it will always connect me with, uh, with my father, which uh, is a big part of the reason I'm here. You know, there's a part of Michael that is still, you know, a 15-year-old from Canada who can't believe that, that he's had the success that he has had and so enjoyed. Fox wasn't ready to retire completely. He found new roles in film and television. In the fall of 2005, Michael signed on for multiple episodes of Boston Legal. Question. Go. When do you see yourself liking me? He played Daniel Post, um, who is a billionaire who is dying of lung cancer, a stage four lung cancer, knows he doesn't have very long to live, and he's being sued. Before I start, um, I know you think your parents weren't involved, but look at you. I think you turned out super. 
By the way, Your Honor, I'm, uh, I'm dying. The part required him to be um, very calm and very focused and, uh, and very determined. I object. You object. He's trying to garner sympathy, Your Honor. I only mean to say that my current situation gives me a unique view on life. Now, for somebody with Parkinson's disease to play a calm and, uh, and, and, and focused individual, I mean, that, that takes a great deal of concentration. I can't imagine how nerve-wracking that was for him to, to have to think about it and, and think about, oh, don't move your arm or don't move your leg. You felt a billion-dollar company for the ground up. Why does this excite you? I don't know. I mean, stocks, futures, it's sort of a fantasy, you know? You can't really see it. But a courtroom, a judge, someone who needs my help that I can see, smell, hear, touch, taste. It's four stars, five senses. I was really good in there, wasn't I? His symptoms are challenging, and they do change, and he does have to continue to adjust how he deals with his symptoms. Michael, like most Parkinson's patients, really, um, you know, faces what can be a challenging day. And he does it with the, all the qualities that you would imagine that he brings to it, his humor, his tenacity, you know, timing. Whether it's acting his heart out, searching for a cure, or loving his family, Michael J. Fox doesn't do anything halfway. Michael has devoted his life now to, you know, something that's a higher order than acting. He's fighting for his life, he's fighting for everybody else's life at the same time. He saw this as a huge opportunity in his life to really accomplish something way beyond just being an actor, just being a, you know, a personality, just being a star. The star has brought in more than a billion dollars at the box office, won four Emmys, four Golden Globes, and two SAG Awards. But one prize is still out there. The acting thing and all that is a preamble to this true calling, which is bringing this disease to an end. Michael's often asked how close we are to a cure, and we talk about this. We don't know, but we do know this. The work we're doing is making it happen faster. This is something that can be cured in our lifetime. Michael and I both believe that. I don't think it's going to shorten my life. In fact, I think by the time, well before I get to the natural end of my life, we'll have resolved this. There's just a generosity of spirit in his work and in, in who he is as a man. And uh, he is a ferociously intelligent and talented guy. It's uh, in that cute little package is a guy who wants to win. He's a fellow who uh, knew from an early age what he wanted and he was hell-bent to, uh, to realize his goals. And uh, despite some adversity, he, he uh, stands on top of the hill and, uh, and uh, I applaud him for it. I'd have to honestly say, you know, if you'd have asked me 18 years ago, um, I couldn't imagine what he has now. I, I'm so proud of him in so many ways. My life is so filled with positives and so filled with blessings and so filled with things that that I wouldn't trade for anything in the world. I would not be as happy a person today uh, were it not for this journey.